looking back on it, there was signs that this was an exceptional storm. We had just been married, and I was thinking this would be a great place for our honeymoon. Uh, I, was, I wanted everything to be just perfect. Because I've never heard thunder that far. And I mean, it was literally an hour and a half before the storm got to us. I could hear the rumbles. Nasty little storm coming. The um, wind just stopped. There was no sound, no movement. And it was just this chartreuse green sky all around us. Ooh, damn nasty looking storm coming. The wind hit, it was, just went from pretty much calm to like no wind I've ever been in before. I kept looking in the sky thinking, you know, a funnel cloud was gonna drop out. I thought it was a tornado. The biggest trees took it the hardest. And there's areas where they're just snapped off 20, 30, 40 foot high. We both thought it was many different things, thought it was maybe a tornado, maybe just a big thunderstorm. Um, I didn't know what it was. Well, what happened on July 4th, 1999 was a very extreme, unusual event. Uh, we had a, what we call an event called a derecho that moved through northern Minnesota. If you look around, you can see that there are a lot of trees blown over. The trees were blown down by a wind coming all from the same direction. So in other words, not a tornado. These were what we call straight line winds or downburst winds. With a downburst wind, we have this huge rush of cold air coming from a thunderstorm. And as it hits the ground, it spreads out in all directions. And so anything in its path will get mowed over. But everything is laying in the same direction. Uh, we had an area that was blown down by winds of over 100 miles an hour, of an area of about 10 to 12 miles wide and about 30 miles long. It was about approximately 500,000 acres of trees were blown down. What, 20 million trees down in 20 minutes? The National Weather Service has just activated the public warning alarm tone. You know, meteorologically speaking, our National Weather Service has the public safety that that is their number one priority. Yeah, our job is to make decisions for warning the public in, in severe weather situations, so we're trying to use everything we have available to us, our spotter network, our radar. A derecho is, is different than all the other storm complexes in that it, it basically is a long-lived straight-line wind event. Uh, straight line winds can happen in almost any thunderstorm for a short period of time, but the derecho is unique in that it occurs, it has to occur over about a 250 mile length and along the axis of the storm system to actually be classified as a derecho. So a hurricane usually doesn't cause a great big gap in the forest that's miles and miles in length. It causes scattered little patches of, of blowdown. Tornadoes cause long, thin paths of blowdown that are a few hundred yards in width and maybe miles in length, and the trees are all convergent because they were being sucked into the tornado. A derecho has a very distinctive pattern of blowdown because you get a big oval-shaped pattern of damage that can be many miles in length and several miles in width. The other really important feature here, and the reason that many of their characteristics remain a scientific mystery is because they're much lower frequency of occurrence. They don't happen anywhere near the same frequency that tornadoes do. It's hard to make a lot of inferences of scientifically about the conditions that maybe cause the birth of one of these or maybe sustain one of these or have impacts on the scale of one of these unless you collect enough data from a large enough population. Looking at it with satellites sort of helps us to see the top and sort of the surrounding area and then radar helps us to see more into the core what's happening towards the ground. So with those combination of tools we can begin to look at different angles and different portions of the storm. The obvious indicator on radar would be the appearance of a bow echo, a very arced type of a shape to the highest reflectivities. And this area around the apex of the bowing is where you'd have the strongest outflow hitting the grounds. So that's what's doing all the damage to homes and trees. The most important thing we get using the satellites is an idea of the trends on what's happening on the top of the storm. What we're enhancing here with the colors is looking at coldest cloud tops. That helps us to pick out where the regions of the strongest updrafts are, and hence that's the core of the storm. So with this enhancement, the coldest cloud tops are in the red to black colors. Once it's formed, once it's born, its lifespan is fairly, can be fairly significant, hours to days. 
so that if you can envision a feature like that passing across the United States landscape, it's going to cut a damage swath that's pretty significant. Here we're looking at an animation of GOES thermal IR channel data. This is covering about 20 hours in time. And this allows us to follow the initial stages when the storm first became obvious, and then it began to move eastward over the northern plains. And then finally it intensified and became a derecho over regions of northern Minnesota. You could follow it in time for three days, and it was responsible for new storms at a distance of over 6,000 miles. And that's pretty uncommon. Usually a derecho can be tracked for maybe 12 hours or a day, but two or three days is uh, very unusual. We clearly know by now that they're detectable with our modern technology and that we can track them pretty well. And in retrospect, we can go back and quantify their characteristics. Perhaps the most important question with respect to derechos is what leads to the birth of one of these storms. We want to be able to forecast these storms with a great deal of lead time. We had no warning at all. Well, it was just big things of green coming right <laughs> Yeah. The National Weather Service is the nation's weather warning company, if you want to put it that way. It's our job to tell people when bad weather is coming. And that was always a fear of mine, is getting stuck in the boundary waters during a tornado where there's no place to hide. It could be that bad, and it's just that gut feeling. I feel like it might happen again, you know, so. Yeah. But I'm going up the day after tomorrow tonight, night, so I'm not too scared.